Okay, we're going to get started. Um, good morning, everybody. This is Patrick Stewart from SkyCatch. Thank you, everyone, for um, joining our webinar this morning. Um, today, we're going to be talking about DJI drone workflows for aggregates professionals. Um, this is the second in our monthly series with DJI. I want to start off by uh, saying thank you to DJI for co-hosting this and sponsoring uh, this with us. So our agenda this morning, uh, we're going to do quick introductions. Uh, then uh, our guest, Bart uh, from DJI, is going to talk a little bit about their aggregate solutions. I'm going to go quickly through SkyCatch aggregate solutions. Uh, and then uh, our, our guest panelists will uh, go through the workflows, which is really uh, the meat of the webinar this morning. Uh, and then we'll wrap up with uh, a long session of Q&A so that we can answer your questions. I uh, encourage everybody to just chat in any questions you have throughout the presentation. And we are monitoring those and we'll be uh, you know, putting them up during, during the Q&A. Uh, reminder for everybody that this session uh, is recorded, so you'll be able to watch it afterwards and access it via our website um, and send it to other people in your, in your, in your company or your, your team. Uh, Quick introductions here. Um, Dallas Van Zanten is going to join us, be one of our one of our speakers today. John Bayless as well. They're each going to go more in depth on their introductions uh, when it's their turn. Uh, Bart Vandervert from DJI is the manager for uh, BD in the EMEA region, and uh, I'm the senior director of product uh, at Skycatch. Uh, without further ado, Bart, would love for you to um, give a quick intro on, your, on yourself and what, what DJI has uh, for the aggregates market. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Um, so great to be here today. Um, so yeah, my name is Bart van der Voort. I, um, I work for DJI in, uh, in the EMEA region. I'm based in Amsterdam. Uh, for those of you who don't know, a quick introduction on our company. Um, today, DJI is by far the largest uh, UAV manufacturer in, in the world. We have over 70% market share, and we've grown from, from a very small team of 10 people in the last 10 years to more than 7,000 today. Um, and the, it's really the last year that we've been expanding a lot on our, our enterprise solutions, really focusing on, on commercial applications for our uh, products. Um, our company has a very strong focus on R&D, and that really shows uh, if you look at the, the products that we've been releasing over the last few months. Um, and more and more now, we're shifting uh, uh, part of these products uh, towards the, the sort of commercial uh, application range. Um, now, as much as, as DJI has, um, has great um, hardware, uh, we do also have a, have a partnership culture that we, we partner up with, uh, with companies who have a, a specialization in, um, in certain areas, and Skycatch is, is one of those. And so we're very happy that we can work together with them. And they uh, and, and support them in, in creating these uh, these software bundles that are are tailored for uh, for construction or in this case aggregates. Um, so uh, that that's great. Um, maybe I'll I'll have a quick introduction on some of our products uh, that we have today. Um, so first of all, the the Phantom 4 Pro is a, a product that we've recently released. You also have the Phantom 4 Pro Plus, which has a, a built-in screen. Um, this is a very um, sort of low cost but high high efficiency um, product um, that's that's very capable uh, for for mapping and for for volume calculation for example um, it has a, a 20 megapixel camera and uh, and a mechanical shutter which makes it ideal uh, for this kind of work then as, next to that we have the the m series which is uh, uh, mostly used for for development uh, of, of solutions um, it has the, the capability of, of adding a range of, of sensors. And then below that you have the Inspire, which is the prosumer uh, drone that we use uh, today. So uh, mostly used in, in, in the film industry, I would say. And then lastly, the Agras is also something that we've been doing. Clearly shows that we are um, expanding in, in, in these different uh, uh, commercial uh, areas. And in this case, that would be agriculture, um, a specific spraying drone. Uh, which we've launched uh, about a year ago now. So that's, that's it for me. Um, I'll, I'll stay here, and if there's a questions, then I'll take them later. But now I'll, uh, I'll have the word to, to the next speaker. 
Okay, thank you, Bart. Appreciate that. Um, so just a quick overview on Skycatch, uh, things that we offer. To start out, we have a flight app for iOS that fully automates um, DJI drones, including all the Phantoms, the Inspires, Matrice, uh, as well as our own drone. Uh, some features of that are intelligent routing with terrain following, so we, we keep the drone exactly inside the area you want to keep it, and we can follow terrain to get uh, more consistent uh, ground resolution in, in changing terrain, uh, and it's set up for really easy repeat data collection. So you can plan out your flight area once and then fly it every week or every month or every day if you want. Um, the, the sort of soul of our solution is our image processing that's in the cloud. Uh, we really focus on generating uh, whatever the most valuable data files are for, for, for all of our users, um, starting out with the most common types, which is the 2D ortho mosaic or the map. Uh, 3D point cloud and, and 3D mesh. Uh, we also offer post-processing, uh, producing contours, digital service model, digital terrain model, and uh, I think you know very useful is we can also deliver all these files in whatever coordinate system you happen to use uh, on your project or on your client's projects. Um, going to visualization and analysis, in addition to the processing and and, and delivery of the files, uh, we offer. Uh, a web app that works on all devices where it's set up for multi-user collaboration. Um, it's 2D and 3D viewers um, in your browser, so you don't have to install any software. It runs really well. You can import CAD plans and compare those to, to your project, so you can see if your, your current status or your as-built, how does that compare to your, to your design and your plan very easily and quickly. Identify problems before they get big. Uh, we have volume measurements and area measurements. And uh, we also offer really easy sharing via links uh, with no login required. So if you want to send a map or a model or something to, to your client or other team members or you know, prospective clients, uh, they can do that really easily. Okay, so that was, that was a little bit um, on Skycatch um, and DJI. Um, the takeaway for everybody here at the webinar um, is this is about education. Um, our goal here is that all the attendees walk away with some, some actionable information, which means that uh, our experts are going to teach you something that you can put into practice right away. That's the most important thing. That's our number one goal. Um, and we really want to focus on, you know, flying is great. Uh, DJI has made some incredible, incredible platforms that are enabling uh, the collection and the creation of data that, that value um, is, is actually massive. Um, so we're going to talk about how to go beyond the flying and, and actually get into the information and really get value. Um, so um, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, um, Dallas Van Zen. Um, he's, he's an expert, especially in this industry, but, uh, but others as well. He's been doing this for a long time, um, and he's got some amazing, um, helpful information to share with all of us. Um, Dallas, would love for you to take it away. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Patrick. Yeah, uh, my name is Dallas. I have been using UAVs in mining and construction for about two years now. Um, I have over 12 years of experience in construction and mining industry. Uh, Cloud Data is a very young but rapidly growing company, and I look forward to sharing some of my experiences on stockpile calculations in the aggregate industry uh, with, with you guys. Um, Cloud Data, we service clients all over the U.S., uh, mainly in construction and mining sectors. We have two parts of our company. We offer pilot services and UAV consulting and implementation. But I would say about 80% of our work um, at this point is in the mining industry. Uh, next. Yeah, so today we're going to talk about successful volumetric, me uh, volumetric measurements. And I'm just kind of going to go through a, a project here, kind of step by step, and, uh, and walk through it. Next. So the goal of this particular project was to provide accurate measurements safely, on budget, and on time to the client. Traditional surveying methods can be unsafe, putting workers in harm ways, collecting the data points, climbing up and down the stockpiles, and with all the heavy equipment uh, working on the site. Um, the, uh, why this is important is because they can get benefit from using UAVs and tracking inventory of your assets on a regular basis at affordable cost. You know, we can collect the data from standing at a stationary location and let the UAV 
scan the site from above. So when it comes to planning, ground control is very important. How we do this is we establish GCPs on the site. Some of the GCPs we use as checkpoints. Checkpoints are collected the same way as GCPs, but not used to process the model, but used to check accuracy of the project post-process. It's a good practice to have checkpoints. It's a good checks and balances. With the data, we can create a quality report to show our clients. Most of the GCP data that we get is in state plane coordinate system. We use a website called EarthPoint to convert to WSG84 so we can export to Google Earth. We export them as a KMZ file so we can open and view them on our tablets in the field, making it easier to locate the markers uh, when, we're, when we're actually on site. And most of the GCPs uh, that we see are normally wooden stakes or steel pins in the ground and they're protected by some type of high-vis ribbon. And, uh, and those can be hard to spot, so having this export of the KMZ file, it gives us a, a good idea of where they're located and we can walk up on them and, and mark them. Next. Depending on the size of the project and the elevation change um, will depend on how many GCPs are required, but a minimum of three GCPs and two checkpoints is, is what we like to see, but typically um, between five and 10 uh, GCPs. You want to make sure they are not too close to each other. 200 yards apart is a good rule of thumb. And you also want to make sure that they're on the, um, some flat ground. You don't want to put them on a slope. Once all GCPs are located, you want to mark them with high-vis paint, or you can use SkyCatch's QR code targets. Um, those are automatically detected in their software. Uh, next. Safety is very important. Uh, you want to make sure you have all of the proper PPE, hard hat, work boots, high-vis vest, whatever the requirements are of that particular site. Set up in a safe, secure location, um, you know, away from heavy equipment. Go through your safety checklist prior to every flight. Um, check for the hazards like power lines, tall buildings, trees, cranes, um, or anything else that, that might hinder your operation. Um, at this point, airspace should have already been checked, taken care of, um, you know, way before you even get up, get to the site. Uh, DJI and SkyCatch apps do have some nice built-in uh, safety checklists that kind of go through the drone health, like satellite count, battery health. Uh, but we recommend having an external checklist as well that covers more than just just the drone health. When we plan a flight, we use either DJI's app or SkyCatch's flight app. Uh, you want to make sure the GCPs are in your flight path and adjust the flight area if you have to. This is another good reason um, why to export the GCPs as a KMZ so you can double check your map um, is covering uh, those GCPs. You want to double check your altitude and overlap settings. We normally fly at 300 feet and 70% front lap and side lap, but it, it really varies. Um, sensor to sensor and also um, job to job as well. After we complete the mission and capture the necessary data, the pilot will upload the images to either um, our system, cloud data system for our project and engineer to download and start processing in PIX4D or upload to SkyCatch um, where it's automatically processed for you. Uh, next slide. So once we do that, we upload the images and GCPs into PIX4D by importing the CSV file. From here, we confirm the right coordinate system is used and locate and mark the GCPs in multiple images. For this particular project, we have five GCPs. Three were used as GCPs and two were used as checkpoints. If using SkyCatch as GCPs, um, they're automatically detected um, in their software as well. Uh, next slide. So outputs. Um, once data is finished processing, we review the quality report and we look for any big deviations. We verify the accuracy in the point cloud by checking the checkpoint accuracy with the GCP data. Um, from here, once that is complete, we can do um, some 3D measurements. You can use SkyCatch or Pix4D or, or even Autodesk tools to get volumetrics out of your stockpiles. 
Um, some of the common deliverables are a 3D mesh and model. Um, you can view that in Skycatch's web viewer. Or what we like to do is actually import to Sketchfab and annotate every single pile with the name of the material, the date it was surveyed, and the, the quantity um, of that particular material. Um, same with the 2D map. Um, you know, with the 2D map, you can annotate in Skycatch's dashboard with the volumes, um, or you can use Bluebeam or Adobe as well. Uh, next. So once you, once you have all that data, um, it, we like to make a spreadsheet. Um, spreadsheets are really valuable. Um, you can set up for repeat measurements over time. You can add graphs, show all projects on one page, or in this case, show a list of materials that are at that particular site. Um, it's good to compare sales, forecast, and purchase orders. And it's also good to track you know, what you produced versus what you sold. And it's good information for um, the financial stakeholders as well. Uh, next. So mistakes to avoid. Double check to make sure the area of interest is fully captured before leaving the job site. Um, I would even go as far as starting the upload process on the site and make sure all the photos are geotagged and also that the camera um, didn't stop taking pictures throughout the mission. Uh, this could be a costly mistake if you travel to a job site and don't realize until you get back to the office that you're missing data. Um, I have personally done this and I had to travel back to the site the next day um, at no additional cost to, to the client. So it could be, could be a costly mistake if, uh, if you don't double check. Um, also I would have spare parts. Have a spare USB cable for your tablet or smartphone. Um, you know, if you use your tablet to fly, make sure your phone is capable of running uh, whatever app, fly app software that you're using. Um, you know, tablets can break or freeze or, or don't, don't work sometimes. So make sure you have either a spare phone or tablet. And then have some extra micro SD cards. They're small, you can lose them. Um, you know, one can fill up pretty fast with images if you don't transfer the data off. So um, it's, always, it's always nice to have spare parts. It could cost you um, a lot of time if you have to try to hunt down a, another USB cable or, or micro SD card once you're in the field. So safety is very important. Um, having a safety checklist that you go through before every flight, flying missions can be a monotonous task. It's easy to get complacent. You don't want to make a cost of mistake that's, uh, that's avoidable. So I highly recommend having your own safety checklist. Uh, next. So the question you should be asking, can I meet the client's expectations on accuracy, schedule, and safety prior to committing to any project? Um, it's a nice little quote I like. The job you turn down might end up being your best job. And what I mean by that, um, for an example, if you have a client that wants you to fly a job site that is close to an airport and a controlled airspace and you cannot get, get permission to fly there, but the client doesn't know the rules and regulations, it's up to you to know and follow the rules. You might you know, have an internal conversation with yourself saying it's only five minutes, five minute flight, I'm only gonna be flying at 200 feet, but it's not worth it. By you telling the client no and explain to him why, why, why you can't, he'll have more respect for you and it could lead to more business with this client and he could refer you to other colleagues. Um, so it's not worth the risk. Always do the right thing. And that's all I have. All right. Thank you, Dallas. Really appreciate you going through that. Um, really helpful um, specifics there. And, and for the questions that have, have come in, we're, we're noting those and we'll hit those during the Q&A. Um, now I'd like to introduce John Bayless from Inbala. Um, been doing this for, for a really long time also. Um, he's going to bring a slightly different perspective uh, and, and a different approach uh, from Dallas, but they're also complementary. So, um, John, I uh, would love for you to come uh, introduce yourself uh, and take it away, please. Thanks, Patrick, for the uh, introduction. So, as Patrick said, my name is John Bayless. Um, I'm currently doing some freelance uh, consulting uh, right now, but I have had the um, opportunity to work for over seven years. Um, 
in the aggregate industry, including um, for a very uh, progressive company. So I worked um, in the Canadian division of uh, Wholesome Limited, and we were actually one of the you know very early adopters of, of UAVs, uh, specifically for our you know mine planning, compliance, and compliance reporting initiatives. We actually started using them back in uh, 2010, and uh, you know across all of our active sites. And um, today. Um, I really want to talk about um, the, sort of the mine planning elements and cost forecasting elements that UAVs and data collected from UAVs can give you. I think what you're hearing a lot about, you know, in case study, recent case studies is a lot of aggregate companies using UAVs for inventory management, stockpile volumetrics, and they're talking about branching off into mine planning. So I'm hoping to provide a little bit more context on exactly what that means for operators. Next slide. Yeah, so the, the goal really is, and I think this is really straightforward and it really applies to any um, aggregate site or any aggregate company regardless of size, and that is to you know, ensure that you're accurately forecasting your extraction as well as your production costs to ensure it's aligned with your budget and sales forecasts. Uh, budget and sales forecasts are constantly moving and shifting due to you know, market demand or market constraints or other financial constraints. So there's a need to make sure that you know you have the necessary tools to adjust your forecast accordingly. Um, and one of the best ways of doing that is actually using UAVs. I think in the past when you were out you know using traditional survey methods for stockpile volumetrics or you know trying to calculate uh, costs associated with extraction, it was something that you did less frequently. A lot of the time it was due to cost. There was higher uh, health and safety risk associated with sending contractors out in those parts of the site to do that work. And now with the use of UAVs, there's the ability to collect this data more frequently, um, you know, at a less expensive cost. And all of that information really leads to, you know, much more uh, accurate forecasts. And I mean, pits and quarries are very complex, uh, high cost operations. And I think that, you know, this presentation is sort of falls in line with the, with the saying, make a ton, sell a ton. Um, I think the last thing any operator wants to happen to them is they run out of certain products during a um, during a job, and having to shift production elsewhere or not meeting their customers' uh, needs, or having to reforecast multiple times, you know, during a given period because of the fact that there's inaccurate data. So that's really um, one of the reasons why you know UAVs especially have the ability to um, you know gather that information that you need in a much faster way compared to previous methods. Next slide. So when I talk about mine planning, um, I mean, for those of you who aren't familiar with the industry as well as that term, it's, it's, it's really just a general term used within the aggregate industry for managing uh, future extraction and production uh, within your pits or quarries. So um, what I've done here is I've just highlighted some questions that I think would be beneficial for especially some of the producers to ask yourself um, that especially aren't using UAVs is, you know, what information do I need to collect for my forecast? You know, it could be, like I said, stockpile volumetrics, it could be uh, blast yields, you could be trying to calculate um, volume of overburden that needs to be moved, or you may be doing some much more long-term forecasting uh, calculations related to reserves and rehabilitation reclamation activities. Um, the other next question is, how often do I need to collect this information for my forecast? As I mentioned before, traditional surveying methods, you may not have been collecting it as frequently as you would have liked uh, to support your forecasting um, efforts just due to the, um, you know, the higher cost as well as the more timely timeliness of those methods compared to utilizing UAVs. And lastly, how accurate does this information need to be? Um, there's definitely certain pieces of information you're going to want to be really accurate, so ensuring that you're getting, you know, essentially survey grade quality data in order to make sure that your forecasts are, um, are, are accurate. Next slide. So I think one of the, um, I think one of the big questions that um, operators ask themselves is, you know, especially ones that are starting to use UAVs is, now that I'm collecting this data, how often should I be using it? And I mean, this could apply to producers that are retaining service providers or maybe have their own UAV in-house. And unfortunately, there isn't a one sort of fits all um, frequency here. I think it's very dependent on, you know, the type of operation you have, how much product, how much you're producing, how many products you make, um, 
as well as some of the internal um, and external reporting requirements that may be associated with your business. So the frequencies that I got listed here are merely suggestive and um, you know you can do it more frequently or less frequently and I think one of my lessons or one of the things that I want people to take away here is that you know they obviously have to try this on their own and, and they can adjust accordingly. But things like your drilling, you know, laying out your drilling um, plans and your blasting um, plans for you know the sh for a short period of time, as well as doing your stockpile volumetrics, that may be something you want to do monthly. Um, you know, sales forecasts are, are, are in some companies are done on a monthly basis too. So you really want to make sure that your sales and your production forecasts are are jiving, so that you're not running into a case where you've either got too much material on the ground or not enough. Um, in terms of more medium-term forecasting, this is what I've sort of defined as being sort of semi-annual to quarterly. And um, an example that I thought of was um, with the stripping and land clearing activities. Uh, depending on your site, you may have um, seasonal or environmental constraints in terms of when you can do this activity. So it may be something you do once or twice a year. Um, and that's why I've sort of uh, put it in that bucket. And then for the long-term forecasting, um, I mean, I'm a compliance guy, so compliance reporting is something that will vary by jurisdiction, but um, in my experience, this is something that would be done on an annual basis, um, and I would recommend it, it to be at least um, annually. And then more longer-term stuff would be your rehabilitation, reclamation, uh, cost forecasting, as well as your reserve calculations for your site. Next slide. So some of the other benefits associated with using UAVs, um, again, just based on my experience, um, I've had I had situations where where we deployed traditional surveying methods, and then you find out um, sort of after the fact once you've submitted that data to whoever needs it that you didn't get enough information. So I think UAVs really um, you know eliminate the need for doing additional site visits to collect the same data, assuming that you know your the the UAV is collecting all the data that's needed in that first visit. And um, lastly, um, I think this is a really important one as well, improving your reputation with stakeholders. And when I say stakeholders, you know, I'm talking about your customers. You know, inventory management is extremely important, you know, meeting their product needs, um, fulfilling your duties and your contracts with them. Um, employees as well. I think if you're managing, a, um, ma managing the site much more efficiently, um, you know, you're avoiding things like excessive plant shutdowns if you have too much material on the ground. And uh, just from my experience, um, this actually does, this type of information that you can collect from UAVs is really beneficial uh, with the regulators. So for any regulatory reporting you may have to do, um, you can definitely um, sort of gain some points there in terms of building your reputation with them. Next slide. So just to sort of end it off, um, just, um, just some mistakes to avoid. Um, like I said, I was fortunate enough to work for a very progressive company that was using UAVs since 2010. And I think one of the biggest mistakes is not making the switch to UAVs. Um, I know there's, it's, um, you know, there's always a tendency to be hesitant about using, utilizing new technologies, but I think the reality is, is this technology has been around for a while. It's getting better every day. And uh, there's no better time than now to make that switch. Um, the second point I wanted to make was a lot, of a lot of the case studies that are out there right now, I find, are strictly focusing on um, you know, stockpile volumetrics, and that's great. A lot of great data comes back from that, but don't, don't just think about UAVs for a single purpose. I mean, think big picture here. Uh, look at the entirety of your site and figure out what data am I collecting already that I could collect in a much better way using UAVs. And lastly, not sharing information with the right people. I think that's... Uh, Paramount's pretty much anywhere. I mean, communication is key. There's no point in, in let's say, the operations uh, department collecting all this information and not sharing it with other departments such as sales, health and safety, or the environmental land management departments because there's so much data collected. Um, it's It's got a lot of um, uses, um, sort of multidisciplinary uses, rather than just uh, strictly operations. So uh, next slide. So I guess the question that, you know, everyone is hopefully asking if you're an operator in the aggregate industry is, I mean, this kind of ties into the whole saying of, you know, work smarter, not harder. And it's, you know, how can I spend less time forecasting while improving the quality of my forecasting? And I think utilizing UAVs and drones is, is definitely one way that you can uh, help achieve that. And that's all for me.
All right, thank you so much, John. Uh, really interesting stuff, and it was great to get um, that different perspective of you know expanding this technology and the use of the information out to different parts of the business. Um, thank you so much for going through that. Um, all right, so that wraps up the the two workflows. So let's just talk about quickly what is next, and then we'll go into the Q and A. Thank you, everybody, who's been submitting questions this whole time. Um, so. Quickly, uh, the DJI and Skycatch are doing monthly webinars now. So this is the second in the series, and the next ones that are coming up include BIM coordination, uh, getting just getting started uh, in reality capture. We're going to do uh, part two on our construction workflows that we did last month and get some new workflows, uh, and we've got more. So if anybody um, is interested in joining us on any of those or you have ideas or requests for other topics, would love to hear from you. Uh, please just email me at patrick at skycatch.com. Um, all right, so let's go to Q&A. Um, let me find uh, the first question. So the first question here is, is, is actually for Dallas. Um, and, and John, feel free to chime in. The question is, how do you establish your ground control points? Do you use survey grade equipment? Do you hire somebody? Is it given? Or how do you go about that? Yeah, I would say most of the time they're given by the client, um, and most of them are done by portable RTK units. And if we have to establish them, we use um, Topcon um, portable RTK unit to establish ground control points. So either Topcon, but most of the time uh, the client provides them because they already have access to them, they're already there. Or, or a lot of these construction companies or mining companies have access to the technology themselves, and it's cheaper for them to do it than to hire us to do it. Gotcha. Okay. Um, thanks, Dallas. Appreciate that. Next question is actually for um, Bart. The question is, can you upload DJI uh, Ground Station app or Skycatch Flight app onto the Phantom 4 Pro Plus um, the, the tablet that comes on the, the controller. Uh, the question is, I believe this is not available at the moment, but maybe available later. Um, I don't know if I can't hear Bart. If uh, Bart, if you're if you're talking, can't hear you. I may. Oh, may sorry, yes, I was <laughs> <All right>. um, <laughs> Yeah, I was I was talking. Yeah. Um, so um, I would have to take it up with the R and D department, um, or maybe Patrick, you and I have to connect on that. Um, okay. But that's a very good question. Um, okay. Yeah. Great. All right. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll see if we can follow up on that, and maybe maybe just get it posted on the FAQ on our side or your side or something. Uh, yeah. Find out what's going on. Okay. Uh, Let's see. The next question: Can you please discuss the workflow of converting a digital surface model to a digital terrain model to remove noise from trees, vehicles, etc.? Um, I think I can take that one, at, at least from the Skycats perspective, and then anybody else that can chime in. But um, at Skycats, we developed a computer vision software that automatically um, classifies and removes things that are not Earth, so man-made objects and vegetation. Uh, then we fill in the holes and uh, generate the DTM. That's a process that I think commonly you, you can do it manually too. You can you can grab some point cloud manipulation tools from Autodesk or others and, and cut things out. Um, I think we we tend to see that uh, that might be a four to eight hour total process, and and for us it's uh, typically around thirty minutes of process of post processing um, and then deliver the files. So. Um, if, if uh, Dallas or John, if you have anything to add there, go ahead and uh, jump on in. Um, here's a question for Dallas. What, uh, what vertical datum do you normally use, and are your GCPs in 3D? Yeah, the GCPs are in 3D, so they do have X, Y, and Z um, values to them. And it depends on, on where we're at. So most of the time it's local datum, so uh, state plane if we're, it really depends on where we're at. Um, you know, every location has their own coordinate system, so, but we always use 3D GCPs. Okay, thanks, appreciate that, Dallas. Um, 
This might be a good question for John um, in, in Dallas too, but uh, I'll let John chime in first, uh, especially from the aggregate producer side. And the question is whether it's a grain piled up on the ground or aggregate, when must a licensed surveyor uh, be involved in the process and when can you use this information for your, I guess for your business operations uh, without a licensed surveyor? This is this is the use of a licensed surveyor just specifically for for piles or just more general. I, I think they're really saying you know if you're a drone service provider or you're flying for yourself, is there a way to think about when you need to get a surveyor to stamp off on the on the map or the or the, or the volume measurements or whatever it is, uh, and, and when is it okay to to not have that that sign yeah, off? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think I think generally for a lot of the information that you're collecting for your mine planning, especially more on the shorter term, um, that's something that you wouldn't necessarily need a licensed surveyor for. But as soon as you start moving into some of those um, longer term items and even due diligence items, so if you actually have to do a you know a full like legal survey and determining that you know you are your site is operating. You know, within its uh, within its limits, you know, you're not encroaching on any buffer lands. As soon as you get into that level of detail, I think that's when it would be appropriate. Um, and in some cases, it would be required to use a licensed surveyor as opposed to just you know sending out a, a drone on your own. Okay, great. Thanks, John. I appreciate that. Um, next question: uh, Is there an advantage in using a double grid? Uh, with an angled camera, if, for example, uh, they put it at the gimbal at 70 degrees. Uh, is there an advantage for the, for the applications and aggregates uh, first and then others after, but uh, to doing that? Uh, I'll, I'll throw that one up to either John or Dallas first. Um, I would say for 3D modeling, um, you could get more detail on the side of buildings and I guess if the stockpile or, or the core you're, core you're in had some some big um, walls, but other than that, other than more detail for the 3D mesh and the point cloud, um, I don't think it's necessary. Yeah, we just had like at a point just on the um, sort of the 3D um, output data. Um, yeah, if you're doing like you could you could do visual, you could oh. do inspect, you could do inspections of your quarry faces, um, and obviously a higher detail would be. Would be better because you, you may be able to identify some potential health and safety risks or some potential voids in the face that may uh, result in some uh, blast misfires, which is obviously something that you would want to avoid. So I think that would be the sort of one case where, you know, getting really you know good quality data um, in in three D would be key. Yeah, that's a that's a great point, John. Um, and and Dallas uh, had kind of the same thoughts. Um, it, it definitely depends on what you want to use the information for, and you know I think if you have the time, you might as well might as well do it. Um, okay, so the next question is um, maybe for Bart, but I'd be happy to answer as well. And, and um, anybody, can I use the Phantom Four instead of the Phantom Four Pro in volumetric surveys? What is the difference in accuracy between the Phantom Four and the Phantom Four Pro? Well, um, the Phantom 4 Pro has a has a better camera, uh, I would say. So it's 20 megapixels compared to 12. Uh, so that's that's going to give you some more accuracy. Um, and um, also, the the Phantom 4 Pro has a has a mechanical shutter, which I think you would be better suited to. to but basically, what that means is that you you'll have less uh, distortion um, as it takes a picture. Um, I don't know how to explain this. It takes one picture. It doesn't use uh, like slides, as in uh, like a copy machine also copies the paper uh, gradually, whereas with the Phantom 4 Pro, you would take an instant copy of the whole image. I don't know if that makes any sense. If, uh, if uh, it, to it totally does, and, and I'll just jump in quickly here that um, uh, I concur with the difference in the camera. I think is really important. Um, especially, especially if you have a lot of elevation change at, at your site, or you have any any vertical um, obstructions, you can fly. You can actually get, get the same resolution at a, at a at a much higher altitude 
um, flying the P4 Pro. Not to mention the safety aspect that there's um, collision avoidance on, on all sides. Yes. Um, I think is I think is a huge advantage, and and the, the cost difference is actually pretty small. Uh, we definitely recommend the use of the Pro. Um, it will make everybody's life easier and better, and actually get you better quality information uh, for your for your company and your clients. Okay, yeah. cool. Um, let's see. Next question. Um, Uh, let's see here. I guess, uh, probably for Dallas, what process do you use to maintain compliance with Part 107 as it relates to arranging uh, that the workers are undercover or in non-moving vehicles? Um, will you say that again about the non-moving vehicles? Yeah, it, it, I think they're they're asking about the you know the regulations related to 107 talks about you know if people if people on the site are maybe not under a, a covering or if they're sitting in a, in a, in a car that's not moving. How, how do you deal with you know, making sure that the, the flight is safe on a site that might be actively working or, or maybe it's not? Well, most mine, mining sites are actively working, but um, we just, the big thing is be aware and then also just communicate with everyone on site what's going on. Um, even if you know and maybe the client rep that, that hired you to, to fly the site, um, it's good for, for everyone on the site to, to be aware of what's going on. Um, you know, you, if you're in a safe location and if, you know, let's just say something happens, um, you know, a big dozer or a big dump truck or something isn't going isn't gonna to get damaged if a, if a drone falls, falls and hits it. So pretty much just everyone that's on the ground, which isn't a lot of people in a, in a, in a mine, you know, as long as they're aware of what's going on, um, and, to ha and try to eliminate as many hazards as you can, then, then you should be fine. Yeah, I, I mean, I think um, what we see is exactly what you do is you get hired by the, by the, the company. Um, everybody there is wearing PPE. They're all aware of when and where the drone is flying. They stay, they stay clear as needed. Um, and it, you conduct a safe operation only with proper prior planning for safety first, mission second, right? I mean, um, I think that goes to also what you mentioned about using your safety checklists that, that you have sort of religiously as part of your process. Uh, and that includes coordinating with uh, personnel that are working on the site, right? Um, okay, cool. So uh, let's see. Next question. How about for, for John? Since you're you you've been in house and now you're you're a consultant working with with quite a few different companies. Are you seeing any trends um, of usage of drones in house versus hiring out to service providers or other outside companies? And do you see any you know how do you compare and contrast the the, the benefits of, of both ways? Yeah, I can provide a little bit of uh, sort of insight into that, um, more so with my experience in the industry. And um, like, as I mentioned, like the company that I worked for, like we were using them back in 2010. So I'd say probably the ease of use um, with some of these UAVs, um, I mean, that has obviously improved dramatically since then. But I mean, for the most part, um, this was something that we always, um, we always hired uh, service providers to do, um, just in terms of, um, you know, they already had all the all the liability, all the training, all the certification in place uh, to do what they had to do, rather than us going out and getting it um, ourselves. Um, so I still think there's, you, you may get some companies that will try and do it themselves. I still think that there's going to be a, um, a, a significant demand for service providers um, to do the work for companies that you know, aren't necessarily willing to try and do it all themselves. Um, but one little, one little piece of, um, uh, that I wanted to add, and this sort of goes back to, you know, we were doing traditional surveying methods through a, a traditional surveying company, and then we moved to a UAV provider, and then we ended up going back with that surveying provider after about three years, um, based on the fact that they ended up 
going out and getting their own UAV. So I think that there's definitely a, you know, a need for traditional surveying companies to incorporate UAVs in their services. Um, but as I mentioned, I think that with the way a lot of aggregate companies operate, this is something that they don't necessarily want to uh, take on themselves, and I think that they'll still use service providers. Great. Uh, um, thank you for that, John. Um, good information there. Um, so I, I, there's a question here uh, first for Dallas and then for, for John, which is it's, it's related to accuracy. So Dallas, you talked about the importance of GCPs and checkpoints. Um, the question is, are there times where GCPs are not required or less required? Um, and could you describe those? If there are any, and if they're not, could you maybe talk a little, a little bit about, you know, in your experience, why, why they, they are or are not? Yeah, so from my experience, um, I would say GCPs should always be used if you're going to be comparing data over time. So, you know, cut and fills, um, or if you want to track a pile changing, you know, from month to month, uh, you're going to want to use GCPs. Um, that way, the accuracy would be the same, you know, every time you have some consistency there on the data. Um, if, when they're not required, you know, there's there's some controversy for standalone piles um, not having GCPs if they're if they're smaller, like under 500 yards. Um, you know, the accuracy is the between using GCPs and not using GCPs really isn't going to be that big of a difference. Um, but you know, if you if you get into one, two, three, or hundred thousand yard piles, um, you know, the the number obviously grows. But at the end of the day. 3% off is 3% off regardless if the pile is 500 yards or, or 100,000 yards. So I would recommend just using them uh, when you can. But like John stated early on that, you know, really what, what type of accuracy is the client looking for and, and just try to meet your client's needs as well. Yeah, I don't have anything to add there, uh, Patrick. I think... Uh... I agree with everything with uh, what Dallas just said. Okay, great. Um, so that, appreciate that, Dallas. Thank you. Um, so I think there's a there's a host of questions about you know what is the accuracy of the outputs um, after they've been been processed. Um, I, so I'll field that one quickly here. Um, the, the accuracy is typically as as good as as what you feed into the processing. So if you don't use GCPs, you will end up with, with an, I would say, an average accuracy of um, whatever the, the GPS accuracy is that day while you're collecting the data. Could be one meter, could be 10 meters or more. Um, uh, I think important to note is it will also be not consistent throughout your model. You will have varying levels of accuracy across that. Um, when you use ground control points, checkpoints, or you know, uh, a post-processing uh, post PPK solution like Sky Catches, you're going to get uh, tighter accuracy. You're going to get down in that you know, two to five centimeter range. And uh, if, you, if you set up your GCPs right, or you can use the like PPK solution, uh, you're going to have consistent accuracy um, throughout, that, throughout that model, um, which I think is pretty useful um, and important if you're measuring multiple, if you're doing volume measurements, you have multiple piles all across the site, um, or you maybe, maybe you have a, a large face um, of a hill that you're, that you're carving out, and, and you might need to take a measurement across the whole thing. Um, I, and, and Dallas and John, uh, or Bart, please, please jump in if you have anything to add there. Okay, I think it sounds like you guys are probably good on that one. Um, okay, uh, next question. Um, this is a great one. Um, so what other purposes do you guys think UAVs can be used for in the future uh, in, the, in this industry and in sort of the aggregates and construction materials space? Now I'll, I'll leave it for, for any of you guys to just jump in. I think it's um, I think it's going to be dependent on what kind of sensors we see coming up in the future. Um, 
you know, if we're talking yeah, about, and, and you know, ground, ground penetrating radar, I think that there's definitely some opportunities there, for, especially on the due diligence side. Um, doesn't matter if you're, you know, looking at, you know, being in the aggregate industry or any industry. I think that there's, uh, I think it's, I think there's a lot of possibilities. I think it's just a matter of what sensors, um, you know, come out and end up being uh, part of a drone system. Yeah, and I think also once drones become more commonplace uh, within this industry, then it will become also more valuable for companies such as DDI to, to develop these specialized sensors. Uh, I mean, we're already working on, on some of them, but um, uh, it's not going to be very long anymore, I think. And um, yeah, so there's more coming. Great. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I kind of had the same thought, which is, you know, my, my analogy is always uh, getting started with this technology is like learning how to swim. And if you pace back and forth at the deep end, trying to learn how to swim before you get in the pool, you'll never actually start swimming because you can't teach yourself to swim if you're not in the water. Um, so the best thing to do is get started. Um, go to the shallow end, step into the pool, onto the stairs, get your feet wet, get your ankles wet, and start to get successively deeper until you're, you're up to your neck and you can learn how to doggy paddle. And before you know it, you're gonna you're gonna learn the breaststroke and the freestyle fly and all those things. So the best thing to do is get started. Um, and I think as an industry, um, we're all going to discover new use cases that none of us had ever thought of before, um, including with with the current technology or, or, or the current sensors that are available, um, including including things like lidar um, as that starts to become more prevalent um, in the air, um, but also just with cameras. I think it's actually really exciting um, just to see even what was what's been presented today or things that you know aren't being used everywhere yet. So um, yeah, I would also say a, a higher degree of automation is probably going to be part of um, this as well. This evolution. Yeah, uh, I, I totally agree. I mean, the the easier the easier it becomes to collect the data. Um, the more use we'll get, the more use cases we'll get. Um, and you know, DJI is, you know, really blazing a trail um, in that arena, um, especially with um, things that have come out uh, recently, such as the P4 Pro with the better camera and, and all of that um, um, collision detection and avoidance. Yeah. Correct. Um, okay. Uh, question for Dallas: uh, Is there a certain time of day? that you like to fly uh, to get the best results? Um, normally you want to fly midday when there's not a lot of shadows, um, but we don't really focus on that too much. Uh, you know, that doesn't really affect, as long as it's not dark and foggy, you obviously you don't want to fly when it's foggy. It won't, it won't really affect the, um, the quality. Uh, you're just going to affect, I would say, the, the how the 2D model looks, per se, but you won't affect the quality. But most of the time, midday flights are, are really nice um, when you can avoid shadows. Gotcha. All right. Um, that's, that's typically what we do uh, for sites that we fly as well. Um, so Dallas, another question for you, um, helping people get started here. Um, how, the question is, how do you go about pricing an aggregate drone operation, and how do you translate the value into an appropriate price point? Um, and, and I think the, the question is really not how much do you charge, but how do you think about that and, and communicate that um, to your, your clients? Yeah, so you, know, you really got to look at yourself and what do you value one, if you're the pilot, what do you value yourself at? What do you value your assets at? So your, your drone, um, you know, how far away is the site? These are all questions you should be asking yourself. Um, uh, you know, do I got to drive there? Um, so how much gas am I going to use? So you should be asking yourself, you know, what is your time worth? Um, you know, how much per hour? Uh, how much per hour do you want for your UAV? Because you're probably going to have to be replacing it um, and stuff like that. And as far as the value goes for the, for the mining guys is it's going to be cheaper than traditional surveying methods. So selling them on the price isn't going to be an issue. It's going to be selling them on the new technology. 
Great. Uh, that's a really great perspective. Thanks for sharing that, Dallas. Um, OK, so we are at the end of our, of our time here. Um, so I, I want to say thank you so much to um, John and Dallas for joining us and sharing your, your experience and your um, expertise. Uh, really great session. Um, thank you to everybody who attended um, and registered and sent in questions. Uh, I really appreciate that. And I'm sorry that we weren't able to get to all of the questions this time. Um, so please join us uh, on the next webinar. And, and my email is on here again at Patrick at Skycatch. Would love to hear from you if you have follow-up questions. Just fire them off. Uh, and finally, um, thank you so much to Bart and DJI for hosting this uh, with us and sponsoring the webinar. And we really look forward to the next one coming up in March. You guys should be on the lookout for uh, the exact date and topic soon. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Thanks. Have a good day. Bye-bye.